my only currency in life was like, does a hum like me? How does a hum feel? What's a hum doing? And if I didn't have that, I was like nothing. Polyamory is like the perfect antidote to codependency. Some of the stereotypes of is that how could there be enough to go around? Enough time, enough attention, enough love. I have the greatest love in my life right now than I've ever had before. And it has never felt this good. You know, we're told this is too good to be true, but it's not, it actually is our truth. Hi everyone, we're Elisa and Lily, the mother and daughter creators of Style Like You. We want to extend a huge thank you to our partners, Dame and Dipsy, for supporting us in bringing this episode of What's Underneath Couples to Life. Dame is a leading sexual wellness company that's creating beautiful pleasure products for people with vulvas. And Dipsy is an amazing app where storytelling meets sexual wellness so that you can find more confidence and joy in and out of the bedroom. Stay tuned to the end of the episode to learn more about our amazing partners and the offers that they have for you. Can you describe who you are to each other? Lindy and I have been married for, it'll be seven, seven years in July. And we've been together for uh, 11 years next month. Basically kind of like grown up together, raised kids together. And Roy and I have been together uh, a couple of years. And the three of us have been together yeah. Since last summer, we're three sweeties. <laughs> <laughs> there is absolutely a friendship and a relationship and amongst all of us. It just continues to grow and deepen and has become even more layered and complex, but in, for me, all good ways, since the three of us actually have come to know each other. So can you talk about assumptions that people make about you based on your relationship? I feel like people, like especially cis straight men, feel like I'm like getting away with something. I don't have any allegiance to that kind of like masculine getting women. I'm not trying to get anything. I'm with these people. I just have like unlimited respect for the people that I love and I'm in a relationship with. At no point does it feel like I'm doing anything inappropriate. Like, but it, it, that perception is in the air. And I think it has a lot to do with how people are in any kind of relationship. You know, people tend to be exploitative of the people that they're with and they tend to be in a relationship to be like, what can I get out of this relationship? Like, I, I wanna make sure that any behaviors that I've internalized, anything like that, to just constantly check in with myself and, and not be the person I don't want to be. People are going to assume that Aham's was tired of me and needed like a younger, skinnier, more conventionally hot person. Like, yeah, Aham keeps me around because he loves me and I have a good personality, but like, yeah, you like upgrade. Before this really started popping off, <laughs> I, uh, I remember being so afraid of that perception that, you know, because I am a semi-public figure and people speculate about my personal life and are, people are really cruel to me um, online and... And what does that do to you? Like, what are... Because I'm fat. It's definitely, like, present. The more reductive assumptions around someone who is perceived as a third partner or the person who entered into an existing relationship is often that that person isn't getting their full needs met, that they're like a bonus or an extra in the legitimate lives or relationship structure that is the marriage or is the primary relationship. We don't use that language. We don't say primary or secondary. Um, we're all equals. So yeah, some of the stereotypes is that it's more superficial, it can't possibly be as deep or as valid, or how could there be enough to go around? Enough time, enough attention, enough love. There were moments, you know, over the course of time where I sort of found myself creating problems in my head that weren't actually there. Like, oh, what if I am disposable in this scenario? Or what if I am not the material of long-term relationship? Because I'd always rejected marriage. There is a lot of external pressure, expectation, and messaging that you have to constantly reject when it comes to these things. I have 
the greatest love in my life right now than I've ever had before. And it has never felt this good. You know, we're told this is too good to be true, but it's not, it actually is our truth. So can you talk about what was happening in your relationship at the time that you met Roy? So Lin Linny and I have always been, you know, in a, in a non-monogamous relationship, but it's not something that either of us really exercised. I had gone through a divorce right before Lindy and I started dating. My previous marriage, there was a lot of jealousy. So I, I mean, I was, on, I was already on a kick, a non-monogamy kick when we, when we first started seeing each other. But we didn't, I didn't know how to do it. All of our experience had been in very traditional relationship, you know, formats. It turned into a way more monogamous structure than I think we had planned it to. I was, it, you know, in, in a place working with, talking to my therapist, I was really ready to move forward and, and really ready to explore something that wasn't just a traditional heterosexual monogamous relationship. And when Roy and I met, like Roy knew exactly what was going on in my relationship with Lindy. Like you can say like we were bad, we were doing bad. Like I was severely depressed and really overwhelmed by my career. I was just in a really, really bad place, which made me not a good partner. And the sort of concepts of non-monogamy or polyamory or whatever made sense to me. Like I was like, I can, I understand this, but it takes so much confidence to, to do because you can't be codependent at all. Like you have to fully be your own person and just like trust that you are valuable. And I really didn't have that. You know, Aham said something that I have to correct. You know, monogamous, traditional monogam monogamous relationships was what both of us were used to. I was not used to that. No man ever wanted to like be monogamous with me or felt jealousy about me or wanted to like cherish me and keep me as like a special jewel. I was like trash, you know? So, I didn't have that. You know, I had like sh shitty fake relationships with like people who didn't want to be seen with me. So, you know, after we fell into this sort of like monogamous pattern, the longer we were in that, the scarier the non-monogamy conversation became for me. By the time it was like 2018 and I was like making a television show based on my life, I was like, who the fuck am I? You know, you're making creative decisions with like a team of people about what parts of your life are interesting <laughs> and like what parts have to be cut and like which people don't matter. And like, I'm sorry, it's like really, no, you know, especially because I wasn't coming at it from a super healthy place. Like I wasn't in therapy and I clearly like was traumatized by <laughs> my 20s. Like by the time we were making Shrill, I was like, I do not know how to talk to people. <laughs> I, was like, I was like on set in my little chair being like, like, I don't know. <laughs> you know. The model is that men, you know, cycle through women and upgrade to like the hottest possible wife. <laughs> and the model is that I am not worthy of love. And I certainly had that proven to me over and over again by the way that I had been treated. And so all the empirical evidence was telling me that there's just no way that this man loves me and because it's impossible. However, I have to say, even in the most turbulent parts, there was no, this was, there, we weren't ever going to like split up or anything. Yeah. yeah, so what was the, how did the yeah, what was that finally happen? We kind of had a, uh, you know, kind of like don't ask, don't tell policy, you know, around things like that, which sounds so much better on paper than in real life, because one, it really fragments your life, which is really hard. It um, creates distance. It, and if you're the person asking not to be told things, you don't know why that distance is there. And like, I was so resentful this whole time because I was like, why are you so far away from me? Like, I don't understand. It, it operated in this way that was, that was really difficult. And I, I didn't feel right to like, not be able to be transparent about my life and what was going on. And it really came to a head, you know, you know, Roy lost her, her best friend, you know, her best friend in the world. And I mean, that for me, that was the moment that with Lindy, I was like, I'm just gonna tell you, I know you don't wanna know, but I'm just gonna tell you because there's stuff going on and I need to be there. I need to be there for her. I need to be there for you. I need to have a sense of transparency 
in my life so that I can be the most supportive partner possible in a time where I really, where I'm, I'm really needed. And every step that we got closer to sort of transparent non-monogamy, he became a better partner to me. Our relationship and our life together had gotten so much better and, you know, kind of returned to this state of like, it's potential. And that's why like learning to do this has been the most healing thing because I have to trust you, which means I have to trust that I'm lovable and valuable and polyamory is like the perfect antidote to codependency. My only currency in life was like, does a hum like me? How does a hum feel? What's a hum doing? And if I didn't have that, I was like nothing. You oh. have to love with an open hand. You can't, it's not, if you're clutching them to you, it's not love. It's, you know, they're your prisoner. And for you, Gloria, like during this, this initial period, do you want her to know who you, did you, were you pushing that at all? Or like, yeah, what was, where were you at? It did require patience. I was also, reluctant to share about our relationship for quite a long time for a few different reasons. One being it's unconventional nature and that that can be hard to reveal and open up about. Aham and I also share a professional world to some extent. And so we wanted to be utterly professional and respectful about um, any which way we went about it. And then I, really, really cared about Lindy being protected a little bit through all of this because I'm not the big public figure. I was really trying genuinely to be sensitive to it. It wasn't easy. I was falling in love with someone who wanted to be fully available and they actually weren't. It couldn't be open and transparent. And truly that lack of transparency is what caused stress and anxiety for everybody. In just like really logistical way, like scheduling, like planning, you know, yeah. I um, had to change plans last minute because of, of, of those situations. And it, it was, I could feel that it was really unfair to Roya and her life. From where I was sitting, like we were trying to like save our marriage and he would try to explain to me that like, it's really hurtful to this other person when we can't put something on the calendar. And I just remember being like, I don't know her. I don't care. Who is that? Like we're married. Even in my most frustrated moments when I wished it would fast forward, I really instinctively knew it was going to get there. It won't just be that Lindy and I have to like know of each other or there has to be a whole segregated kind of like relationship existence here. When I finally first met Roya, I remember crying like almost immediately and being like, I'm so sorry. Like, I, cause I could immediately see how much they loved each other. And I started to realize how much pain I had caused Roya. It never felt like that to me. I always was very sympathetic to like, this is a process. I just remember the whole time being like, I can do it, hang on. <laughs> just slow <Yeah>. down. <laughs> so I know we touched on it, but can we hear about like, you're coming together and you're meeting and like, what was that story? You know, Lindy got to a place of being open to meeting me and getting to know me in person. And I had wanted that for a long time. I didn't want to be a secret or sh shameful about our relationship. And I desperately wanted something that felt good and healthy and like no one was being forced to perform um, what they didn't genuinely feel. Last summer, Lindy and I started texting mostly around the time that she had just taken off on a one month road trip um, alone. Aham and I were meant to spend some time together during that period and because I live in Portland and they live in Seattle. Aham ended up in the hospital. The situation could have been that like Lindy turns around and goes to yeah, I had like in the hospital. Just gotten to Montana. It was the second night of my road trip, but then Roy was there and I was like, oh, I really see a practical application <laughs> for this too. Like there's an extra person. And then Roya was like sending me updates from the hospital. Cause 
Aham's not. Aham doesn't send good updates. Be like, how are you doing? What's going on? What did the doctor say? And he'd be like, I don't know. And then Roy would send me like a wall of text being like, I have transcribed everything that this. <sighs> yeah, but we started exchanging like really caring, thoughtful texts about you know his condition, but also understanding understanding each other's position. And I said, I'm sure it's so hard to be away right now and to trust and let this other person who you haven't even met yet into the thing that a husband and wife are supposed to be there for. It's in the vows, you know? There really was also something about being trusted that helped me a lot in that process, by being trusted by Lindy. I realized she was letting go of some of her fears and I was letting go of some of my fears. It was a growth spurt, so to speak. If I knew it was gonna process. help so much, I would have had a major gastrointestinal issue <laughs> way earlier. <laughs> our meeting, our actual meeting is really fun. Yeah. Well, we started like flirting. Roya, when we first started, like we had been barely started seeing each other and Roya was like, I think both of you are hot. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so then once we started texting about the hospital, we just started a group chat. And so then we had like flirty group chat and then it was really cute. And then we had a whole plan where I was gonna go to Portland by myself and meet up with Roya and right. like we were gonna have a date. I got back from my trip like a couple, th maybe three weeks before our mom's birthday. The group chat was going fast and furious <laughs> and Aham was like, I just want Roya to come for my birthday. The actual date that I was supposed to go to Portland was like two weeks after that. So. I was like, okay. I picked Roy up at the train station by myself. And then we, Roy and I went and had our date. And it was yep. so cute. It was really, really great. Lindy's so easy to talk to, so funny, so magnetic that I instantly felt comfortable with. And I did not feel like I was just trying to make this whole thing easier. Or to like it was make it hot just, for a hot or, yeah, or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It really was, I think actually that she instantly liked me as a person and I instantly liked her. And it just kept going from there and it's been exponential. Was the flirting and the in-person like attraction also instant? Yeah, for me. Yeah. Both of them texted me like, 15 minutes after they like met and, and they were both like, okay, we're best friends now. <laughs> <laughs> they were both just like, like okay, uh, I, I, okay. <laughs> it's my birthday, I'll take it. <laughs> One of the most beautiful things about where we've ended up is that there has never really been an agenda. I was never trying to, you know, merge relationships or never trying to be a, you know, yeah, it was really organic. It was it was very organic that just really started with the two of them talking. So how does intimacy for each of you differ from past relationships? How do you experience it? How does it happen? What 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 does it look like? I feel like our sex life was always amazing. I felt a real extreme pressure to make everything seem very like even and fair and everyone's getting the same, the same amount, amount of attention, attention <laughs> the same amount of like, uh, and. Okay, but you volunteered for that role. <laughs> you specifically said that you wanted to be project manager. <laughs> <laughs> I think I worked probably a little harder than I had to at, at the beginning in terms of just like making sure that everyone had no doubt about how wanted they were in this scenario. Like I had sort of written off the idea of like experiencing new feelings or like new desires or anything exciting. This has brought me back to life in a in a, such a palpable way where like people notice every day. People are like, oh my God, what's different about you? <laughs> and it's like everything. But also not. Also, it's like I feel like a return to my younger self who was like excited and hungry. For me, I had some insecurities and worries around being the partner that is still getting to know everybody and doesn't have this legacy of like an 11 year relationship and a six year marriage and at that point and all those things. So there's like stages of growth that we're moving mm -hmm. through. 
like really opening up to all the possibilities of the three of us and what Lindy and I have one-on-one -on -one together. All of those dynamics are really exciting. I get so much of what I didn't even know I needed and wanted, physically and otherwise. And it's entirely possible that this would not work with everybody. This is specific to the three of us, but it's yeah. very possible that it could work for all kinds of people yeah. and people don't feel allowed to even yeah. try. When do you, each of you feel the most vulnerable in the relationship? When I worry that I can't be enough, that I worry that I, I can't be there enough emotionally, that I can't be there enough physically for these two people that I love so much. That extends deeper because what will happen is that I'll get so into wanting to make sure that I can be enough to these people that I, I lose myself sometimes like and that I, I I lose my own you know needs and my own mental health. I would say when I'm alone like back alone by myself where I live am I actually alone am I partnered like could this all go away and if it does I'm by myself and these two people have each other still that feeling was more present previously than it is now. And I grow more and more confident every day in it. When I would be away seeing Roya, you can't not have some voice in your head saying like, okay, well, this is the trip when Aham's gonna realize that he loves Roya way more and does not need you and they would be happier without you and they could just be together and like be this beautiful, you know, unit. Now I'm in this situation where like, what if Roya stops liking me? What if, because like Roya's been gone for a couple months on sabbatical and they would go have these long phone calls and he would go for a walk for like two hours and talk to her. And I wasn't jealous like, oh, Roy is getting this time with Aham. I was like, oh, Aham gets all this time with Roya? Like, <laughs> I was like jealous in the other direction where I was like, that's not fair. <laughs> and it me and I and I started having these insecurities of like, oh, is this not real? You know, and then I started being like, ugh. Um, which is kind of a fun <laughs> insecurity to have, like because it, it feels like a crush, yeah. you know. When is the other most beautiful to you, each of you? When Lindy and I first got together, I remember like the the first night that we hooked up, that we just sat up all night talking, like watching dumb TV and making fun of it and like laughing and um, and it was like intimate and sexy and like affectionate and funny and like we can just like talk and we can just like there's this ease and then there's like a way when I'm with Roya where like, we don't have to talk, we can just like hold each other and like be vulnerable and like the the real answer to your question is all the time, all all the time. I'm just absolutely blown away, like that these these people exist and they get to be in my life. There's just the fullness of of the of the beauty of both of them and and all of us, and it's it I it's very overwhelming. Aham gets this really beautiful like childlike quality. I always think about how much trauma you had as a little kid and what a pure loving little being you were and it got ground out of you in, in certain ways and sometimes I can still see it. And it's so beautiful. Roy has this this light that is just especially with like being married for or being together for eleven years, sometimes Aham and I are bogged down and we're just like and Roy will show up and just be like, bing! Like, she'll just be so excited about everything, and she brought you a present, and she, Roy knows everyone's birthday, and she's just like, the, like, pure light. I love the Aham that loves Lindy. I love the Lindy that Aham, you know, the, who loves mm -hmm. Aham and Aham. They really do have an incredible chemistry and a universe that they share that I feel beyond privileged to have, to be part of and be included in and that like that universe is expanding and I can feel that. That is what's most beautiful to me. 
What is each of your definition of love? I feel like when Aham and I, earlier in our relationship, when I was, you know, in a much more immature, more codependent place, not to do therapy talk, I wish that I could like crawl inside of Aham's body <laughs> and like have him carry this pain instead of me. And I don't feel like that anymore because to me now what we have is just all three of us standing as ourselves, catching each other. I don't need to disappear to feel okay. I remember when we first talked to our couples therapist about Roya, she was like, well, a tripod is more stable than a bipod. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember That's why they don't even make those. <laughs> My understanding of love now is, you know, choosing to, to like see each other and, and stay and grow and, and care for each other without, uh, without wanting the other people to disappear. When we, when we talk about receiving love or being in love, I feel like that allows you to be discovering yourself and um, coming to better understand, know, and love yourself and meet your own needs and um, be the best person to yourself that you can be. What good love looks like is when you stop loving someone for who they are to you, what they mean to you, and then you love the person for who they are, the actual person that you're with. It's just being, it's being yourself. Love is being yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and being with someone who is mm -hmm. themselves and, mm -hmm. and exploring mm -hmm. the beauty of that. That was just absolutely insanely beyond expectation amazing and wow. We want to extend a huge thank you to our partners, Dame and Dipsy, for supporting us in bringing this episode of What's Underneath Couples to Life. Lily, did you know that women are four times more likely in the last year to say that they do not enjoy sex? Than men? Yes. <laughs> I didn't, but I didn't know the statistic, but I'm not surprised at all. That's where our incredible partner, Dame, comes in. Dame is a leading sexual wellness company creating absolutely beautiful pleasure products for people with vulvas to help bring your solo or coupled play to the next level. As women and people with vaginas, you've probably been taught a few things about sex that aren't serving you. Looking back in my early 20s, there were so many of my early sexual experiences where I was putting my partner's needs above my own and where my partner was pressuring me and I didn't have the self-worth or the knowledge of how to say no. All 500 plus Dipsy stories are consensual, feminist, sex positive, original productions. Try a 30 day free trial for Dipsy when you subscribe with code STYLE LIKE YOU today. If you're interested in getting Dame today, use code STYLE LIKE YOU to get 15% off your first order. Are you gonna go get one, mom? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Is it going to be your first vibrator? Yes. Oh my god. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of What's Underneath with Roya, Aham, and Wendy. For more episodes like this, subscribe to Style Like You. And don't forget to click the bell so that you're reminded of when we drop a new episode on Thursdays.